Hello everyone, I'm Taylor and I'm an alcoholic and uh, I appreciate Roxanne starting it off with a little light note. Um, I am actually still a home group member. I've been a home group member here for 15 years. Uh, COVID came, husband diagnosed with cancer, stem cell transplant, all this kind of stuff and uh, like I became a mass person worried about his safety, all of that and uh, primary purpose group was the only group that I know of local here that stayed live the whole time so I'm very grateful about that for them but and I had concerns so I didn't come and then like when you don't come for a while and then you don't come for a while and you just get a little further out of the center um, I learned about like what an actual craving was in recovery um, and I did, I did already come here and share that at one time, but I think I'll just start off a little bit with that, uh, or maybe not. Um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic and I had a lot of issues with outside issues as well. And um, I went to treatment four times the first time when I was 21 over here at Pondhurst Treatment Center at the hospital that was there at the time. Uh, amazing connection that uh, the lady that was my sponsor there um, oh gosh it's like 30 something years ago uh, I think I was 21 um, it's, it's my currently my sponsor and uh, she suggested since she's a senior ish person uh, that I get another one just in case something happens to her so I don't have two um, but you know what like it's been it's been nice to have to and this year I've needed to and that's why I said it was a nice note to start off on a lighthearted note Whew. I've had the most emotional week this week that I've had since my dad my dad passed <clears throat> um, and that was a little over 10 years ago um, just in the continuing with, you know, when you have a spouse and there's stuff going on, that was kind of a struggle. And then my mom, um, I was her on-site caretaker. For the last three years, and she had a home and lived on my property and um, that and work. And my daughter, who is now 18 and not driving, I got to get that accomplished. If anybody has any ways to get that to happen, I'm desperate. Uh, anyways, it just, um, I was really close to Wallace, uh, the home group member who passed. And even though I wasn't in here as much, I was at his house and with him a lot and trying to help him uh, the, the last couple of years. And you know, we went to the international convention in um, Atlanta t together, not together, but like he would, you know, I was, he forgot all of his heart medication. At that time he had 25% heart function, like, and he needed an overseer, and at least I was capable of that then anyways. But uh, just the way that that went down for him at the end of the day, uh, that last 24 hours and some things that happened, it was just hard to see somebody, anybody, whether you knew them or not, to go through that. And then when you know it's somebody who's not able to do better for themselves or whatever, and just the circumstances that happened, um, that was pretty horrific. And then um, my mother did pass. <sighs> On February 20th, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have been present for her. Uh, she spent the last three months in a nursing home because it simply got to the point where we couldn't care for her at home and she needed 24-hour care. Uh, and the facility she ended up in, I mean, it was one where she had a roommate, but she got the best care there. The people were so nice. They were so attentive. Um, the hospice people the second group that we got, because the first group didn't come in two weeks, you know, but the second group were really right there. I feel like God was surrounding my situations and my life and really always has been, or I'd never have made it this far. Um, 
anyhow, but so like the last five days of her life, uh, my sister and I took turns. Uh, and I got to be the one that was there the last words that she spoke. This is a whammy for tonight, um, just because I'm already so emotional. But she said that she was really proud of me, and she, she wanted me to know. And that she saw how hard I worked. And like, who would have thought that you would have come here to be here, like to be this person, to be like a person with a job with insurance or a person with a job or a steady job or whatever, you know, like I really, I really have quite a story. Um, but anyway, so that was pretty amazing. And then um, this other uh, friend of mine, the, I'm a horse person, I knew her from horses and I have to say, we didn't really hit it off really great um, in the first years that I knew her, but we ran into her and her husband at UNC Hospital when my husband was there looking to get a stem cell transplant, and she was, everybody knows, and she's fine with people knowing she's passed, but she um, was getting her tumor removed from ovarian cancer that she had just recently, I mean, she like noticed it one week and was diagnosed the next week and was getting the, ov you know, the huge tumor, grapefruit-sized tumor out of her belly basically the same time we were there and when you meet people under those circumstances there's just a different kind of connection that comes up so she and my husband developed a friendship where they could talk about what they were worried about and scared about and uh, she and I developed a new friendship uh, and I always thought I'm really working on my language these days. Some people in here know that especially. Um, but I always thought she was not very kind. And, you know, come to find out, like, there was a really kind person in there who um, was loving and accepting and a great friend and a mentor to me. And uh, anyhow, she passed in March. And then, um, God, in the last month, my husband's dog who's 15 like didn't eat for two days and she went out to the wood this is totally AA topic but didn't <laughs> it's a I'm talking about going through it and struggling and staying sober and because I'm in the middle of the program I didn't once think about picking up a drink or anything else and when I was not in the center of Alcoholics Anonymous I had my first craving uh, since I've been in sobriety and that was 16 years at the time like and I was you know, and it was totally, at that time, about if it hadn't been for my relationship with my higher power, I wouldn't be here right now. Um, he allowed me the clarity of thought to like, oh, you're having an emotional relapse. You, you're familiar with that. <laughs> um, you know, tell somebody. Uh, anyway, so the dog, I told my husband she's like going into the woods in the dog garden. I'm honoring her wishes. And he, once I did that, then he's following her out there and he's not letting her go. And I'm like struggling with the dog wants to go. He won't let her and trying to find a place of understanding. And all of our angels worked really hard to, to save Chloe. She is 15. She had surgery after not eating for six days. They removed a piece of material from her going into her digestive tract. And she recovered and she has cancer, but like she's as hungry and as naughty as ever. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, I told my husband, like, all of our angels had to work really hard for her. So, like, at that time, then he got another type of cancer on his leg. They did, took it out, did not give him antibiotics, like, who in the world? Um, and then that got infected, and this was all, and this was like two weeks ago, and I'm, and I'm working a new job and a profession I worked in. <laughs> For nine years but I've never done this job and it was a brand new business and none of us had done this business like from the ground up before so like that is why I'm like an emotional woohoo rodeo um and anyhow uh, well and it's but and you know what and it's okay not to be okay uh you know she asked me I was having a pretty good day at the time it seemed like a good idea to be able to come up here plus I try I do try to do what AA asked me to do or you know I have maintain my service position at Castle Works and my four women that I sponsor and my sponsors through the last four years, but, or I don't like to say and, and 
There was definitely a period when I was not in the center of AA, and now I'm trying to get in AA every minute that I can. Um, so sometimes I'm not coming here. I'm coming to wherever I can go or it fits in my schedule at the moment, and I do make it a point to try to get here at least once a month um, and hopefully twice. Uh, and hopefully that will improve once I get better at my new job. Um, so back to, uh, you know, and when we, they pray up here, which I'm very grateful for. I said I need it. Um, I actually, there's some notes I want to, I would love to read to you off of my phone, but I left, left it because I went, well, I went to a meeting on Sunday. There you go. I went to a meeting on Sunday because, like, I've been so mentally, like, loopy. Um, I'm trying to figure out, like, I, I'm having to make notes for one, for one thing, but I'm also thinking about where did I put those. Um, here we go. Uh, anyway, so these are my notes from the meeting on, on Sunday because I was really angry pretty much all day Friday, and I did not conceal it to the thing I was angry at or frustrated at, you know, like you can't have the resentment, it's not good. And then Saturday morning at three o'clock, I woke up and like gasped for air and just cried and said, God, please help me. Anyways, and then I was very tired and I'm back at the very tired place, but uh, my, my things I put down were patience, love and tolerance. The answer is love. Everything is temporary. I am capable of tolerating almost anything and anyone. I am completing my task for ease. Help, ask God for help. Be prayed up. <laughs> I am peace and I am enough. Because when I get really run down, I question myself uh, about who I am and what I'm capable of and I'm okay as a human being because there was, were several years uh, of childhood and then um, active addiction that led up to me feeling like I was a broken human being, that there was just something wrong with me, uh, that there was no fixing me. And uh, that happened through four treatment centers. Um, the, the first two were 12 step based and then I did do 90 meetings in nine days, but like it was then I got it or I graduated or whatever and I was patient rep at my first treatment center over at Pinehurst, 21 patient rep for a week, so I've definitely got it. Um, and, I, and of course I got a relationship going while I was there too. You know, I'm trying to do everything you're not supposed to do and not asking anybody for suggestions or recommendations. Anyway, so of course I relapsed and relapsed. And then uh, the third time I went to treatment, I went out in Oklahoma for a long-term thing because 12-step recovery didn't work for me. And I really appreciate having that part as my part of the story because it allows me to, to, to hear other people that say that and, and say like, you know, I felt that way at one time. And it really wasn't until treatment number four, like I went to ADAC at Black Mountain, it's two weeks, or it was two weeks for me. I was in detox for two weeks first, but then two weeks in treatment, and like I heard everything that I never heard, like I heard it for the first time, but I think I was finally, like God opened me up and I was allowed to hear it. I was able to hear it. Um, I feel like uh, for me, addiction is a disease of distorted thinking and distorted perception. Like my reality is, was not clear and because I've been lacking, lacking sleep here lately and very emotional, it's messed with my head a little bit, but at least I'm clear enough to talk in here. I'm grateful, uh, prayed up. Uh, anyways, but uh, that time I was desperate and ready to do anything that I needed to do to live a different life and to not have those consequences, to, to be a mother to one of my children um, and to, just to, to not live like that anymore. And that uh, second time I went to treatment, a lady there told me if I got on my knees and I prayed and I was sincere in my heart that, that I would get the help that I wanted. Well, I totally heard what she said and I remembered it like at treatment number four, but previously never did I think like I might need to do that or that might be a good idea. Like it never just, it never crossed my mind. Um, and the fourth time I went to treatment, I did that. I'm thinking I probably did it while I was in detox and wants to clear it up because um, I did have two weeks. But uh, anyways, I did that and 
until a year and a half ago when I had those cravings, I never had another craving and I, I, I felt like my higher power understood that like I'm not a person who can live with a craving and live a life because I didn't have the power to fight it. It had me, it had me, it had me going, it had control of me, control of my thinking, control of my actions. Like I knew I was doing stuff I didn't want to do and I could not do it. Um, anyhow, so uh, born in Savannah, Georgia, uh, grew up just off Hilton Head, had a pretty good childhood and there were some abnormalities like my mom left when I was young, I was raised by my grandmother and my father and that was really not happening often at that time and um, I'd like to say she wasn't, didn't feel very nurturing to me and then the maid was a little abusive and um, my dad was working all the time so I kind of felt like I didn't really I don't, I don't know, I, was just in, I felt like I was in the world alone, I felt like I was adopted, I did not belong in my family, and I broke it down to things like nobody else's toes get as cold as mine. Um, I mean like little things, but I was, this was during the time nobody talked about adoption pretty much, and I was like, it's, it's gotta be me because I don't belong to these people. And you talk about feeling different, um, like I felt different than the rest of my family, come to find out it was. But we're all different, you know? Um, I didn't, and I took it personally. Anyhow, so uh, I went to six colleges. Uh, well, it's actually eight now that I graduated from last two. <laughs> um, I went to prison when I was 21 years old. Uh, and I mean, it seems like it was a lifetime ago when it was yesterday. Uh, when I just think about it up here and how scared I was because I'd heard horror stories um, and the lawyer really had me as afraid as anybody else. Um, and it was only for four months, but it was long enough to get a good idea about what that experience felt like, about what it was like. And that experience, you know, that experience did not tell me it's not a good idea not to drink alcohol anymore. Um, as soon as I got out, it was a good idea again. Like, I do well in controlled environments. Like, you put me in treatment, you lock me up somewhere, put me in prison, like, I'm on it. Um, but, like, give me freedom, free will, the options and opportunities out there, I'll tear it down in a heartbeat. Um, so I did. And, uh, yeah, I had probation first, but, like, I just couldn't, couldn't follow the directions. I would, yeah, that was a part, that was part of the problem, not, not being able to follow directions. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I was like, the rules are, there are no rules. I was a rebel, um, rebellious, kind of always thrill seeker. I still am a thrill seeker, but I've managed to make it like in safer environments these days and, and with responsibility for the most part. Um, can't put it all away. Uh, anyway, so I guess I'll, I'll um, oh. Ruth emailed me and said, don't forget to tell them about the Christmas tree field. So, and this is more in the um, end of my addiction. And um, it took me everywhere and the, it took me everywhere I said I'd never go or that it'd never happen or I'd never do. It took me down every road um, that I said, I would like, you know, so we have this, um, I'm not gonna do this yet, you're eligible to. I like did all the yets and as I did all the yets and they happened to me and became part of my life, I hated myself. I hated myself. I loathed myself. And like it's hard to forgive or try to love or heal somebody that you hate. Um, so I was at that fourth glorious treatment center, ADAC in Black Mountain, uh, and we did a class on shame and I realized like that I had all the shame that was attacked from outside sources starting when I was a little girl, things that happened, um, they weren't my, they weren't, they weren't my stuff, but I owned it all, you know, without knowing the difference. And then the shame of what happened in my um, years of drinking and um, outside sources, uh, just, I was like, well, how did I get here? And then, my my mom left when I was two, and, and I had two children, and both of them went immediately to custody of the state uh, in the hospital when I had them because of what I had in my system. Uh, when I had, so I have a son that, uh, he's, he's 19, um, 
anyways, and got my higher power has been very grateful. I mean, or glorious to me that I've been able to see, like, he's at school. I know he has a scholarship. I know it's cool because he's interested in the same things my daughter's interested in. He's doing some acting, but he likes music and he likes photography, and she's all into photography now. And they have, she knows all about him, and he has no idea about her. Um, but isn't that interesting? Um, and the blessing to be able to, to know about him and know that he's okay and that he's safe and he has no idea who I am, and to be able to be okay with that, you know, and pray for him and what's best for him every day. Uh, my daughter, so I was hopeless uh, when he was born, and I fought against his father, who was in the same case as me, for having custody of him in court, because I knew neither, I didn't want to give him either of us us, you know, because because we were broken by my de definition, but, you know, now I see we were, like, sick with a disease of alcoholism. Uh, Anyhow, um, my daughter, same thing taken from me immediately, and I had like aspirations both times of doing something different, I tried to line up the adoption agency. I just wasn't able of responsibly completing any tasks. I mean, like I might get my glass, self a glass of water, but beyond that, like I just couldn't count on myself. Had a uh, fear of failure, fear of success, self-sabotage, the whole world around us of things going on. And um, I had a bag packed in my cake in my closet for two months before I went to treatment the last time. Like I had intentions, but I just couldn't, didn't have the ability to follow through on them. And when your your life is totally jacked up and hijacked, like it's hard to to be able to work some things together. Uh, and I'm grateful that I had enough going on to be able to be in contact with this detox facility and the treatment center. That when I was ready, they took me. Um, Anyhow, uh, so I got custody of Summer, lots of y'all know her, um, when she was a year and three months old, and I uh, never had a baby, I babysat once, it was a disaster, um, so I'm like, now I have this child and I don't know what to do with it, um, really, and people in recovery helped me raise my child, they told me what to feed her, they told me how to bathe her, and what temperature of water, and you know, like I didn't know anything and they helped me raise my child. She was raised in recovery. Um, she's aware of some of the darkest parts of my story, but now I can say, did I tell you that, honey? And she's like, I knew mom. Um, you know, and she's okay with that and she still loves me and I appreciate that. Uh, anyhow, oh, so before, somewhere in all that, uh, I believe it was actually when it was when I was pregnant with her. Uh, I ended up homeless, living in the mountains. Uh, like my mom lived in the same town, but I was not gonna ask her for, like, I'm like not gonna ask anybody for help, right? Some of y'all can identify with like, I'm not gonna ask for help, because I got this. Um, I even had it, you know, when I was homeless. Uh, but I would, I was walking miles uh, to meet my, goals of the day, so to speak, and um, I mean, going, so, you know, I've heard it said, going to any lengths for your recovery, you have to be able, be willing to go to any lengths for your recovery as you are for your addiction, and um, I'd walk 25 miles, I need to be willing to walk 25 miles to go to a meeting uh, for me to stay sober today. Uh, anyhow, so I'm, Ended up out in the Christmas tree field. I couldn't tell you if it was spring or went, or fall. It wasn't winter. I know that, and it wasn't summer. But like it was cold at night, and um, I'd gather my little pile of wood during the day and make me a little fire. And I had all my stuff under like leaves and branches, so it was camouflage. Not that I had a lot of stuff, but what I had, I had camouflage in the field. And I guess because it was an active Christmas tree time, I got away with it. But, you know, I would have to wake up every three hours and put more wood on the fire because it's cold. I'm like sleeping on the ground in the mountains uh, in that little area, which I feel like I was protected in that little area because I was just running around sleeping on the ground anywhere it, like somebody could have found me and whatever could have happened. But I can remember being so tired and feeling like I needed to, Instead of pull over, you just walk over to the parking lot and take a little nap. It was it was uh, <laughs> sand or dirt or whatever, and had me a little pile of woods. I mean, pile of wood, and I had my like flashlight. You gotta have your necessities if you're walking and you're homeless. Um, but I had my flashlight, my jar of peanut butter. Um, just lay down in the parking lot, take a little nap, 
Um, and I woke up and my jar of peanut butter was on fire, my flashlight was on fire, my sleeve was on fire. That's what woke me up um, because my sleeve was on fire. But I mean, to think about like the life I was living uh, and, and that I survived that and I'm okay. I'm like, I'm, I'm really grateful to my higher power and very grateful to, to this group and my, my first home group. Uh, anyhow, for all they've done for me. So I did come in desperate and ready and uh, accepted, hey, you've got, you, like, this is a lifetime deal for you. You might want to think about doing a lifetime commitment. And for me, I'm okay with doing a lifetime commitment because I definitely made a lifetime commitment to, to, to not doing anything kind for myself or anything nice for myself. Uh, excuse me. So I'm, you know, committed to, to recovery for life for me because I know that I can't live outside of these rooms. Uh, I can't, I'm not going to live if I'm not in recovery. Uh, and, and I've also learned I'm not going to stay sober if I don't stay in the middle of recovery. Uh, and I appreciate the home group members and everybody saying hello to me or being welcoming, whether I've been here in two days or two years or whatever. Um, I felt really weird about it, but nobody treated me any differently, and I appreciate that. Uh, all right, so got some time. Uh, let's see. So I don't, I don't really, you know, I, I can remember like the the beginnings of the feelings of alcohol. I will say I was already always somebody who was like to a certain level social to be comfortable, but boy, you put a little alcohol on there, put a little liquor on there, I'm ready to talk to anybody, I'm ready to do anything, you know, and um, just really not thinking about what I was doing. I can remember being at the beach. Oh, I've got a special ring going. Um, <laughs> but uh, being at the beach when I was like 16 and driving my car, I had whoever in the passenger seat all kind of liquored up and like there were these big rubber trash cans that were out for the garbage delivery. I'm just boom, running through one, boom, running through one. And oh, isn't that wonderful watching the garbage go over the, I mean, you know, just doing senseless stuff, not thinking about what I was doing. I can remember being, I only know it was Christmas party because I remember the tree lights because we had up close and personal experience as I was out in the yard, throwing up and like move, like slugging from one pile to the next of the puke and then like crawl up here a little bit closer. But it was all beautifully lit by the Christmas tree lights out there on the shrubs. Um, anyhow, just, yeah, really, I don't know what ever looked so attractive to me about that. And I think the, uh, you know, the, the draw for me was that, um, I didn't have to feel my feelings and I didn't have to think about me or who I was or how much I sucked or whatever. Um, I just was like in the ocean of, of, of the moment, um, which was certainly not reality. Uh, today, I like, I enjoy reality. Uh, I did in my first home group, they were, now I've got a real ring going. Uh, it's you, Steve. Um, anyhow, but I, I did like take a liking to service right away, and uh, yeah, first home group we like go to, we went to the jail and did a lot of stuff like they do here. We had a can y'all not hear me anymore? Was that a yes? It's okay. You can't. Okay, thank you. Um, anyhow. Uh, yeah, so it was very service-oriented group, and I was very grateful for that group. And then I came here and, like, went to a variety of meetings because I had had a lot of experiences here downtown bars. Um, Brad, like, he's he's probably... But anyway, so I was like, Brad's here, uh, you know, because you figure, like, it's been 25 years, like, somebody else had to survive it um, and make it into recovery. But there were, like... Four people that I knew from back in the day that were that, that were sober in this in this group, and I was like, "That's it for me." And plus, because we're service structured and involved in all that stuff, and I did dive into that and have a lot of service positions initially. Uh, the one that I've continued to have for um, probably nine years or whatever involvement and sponsoring people at Casa Works and then also chairing a meeting over there uh, once a month, you know, and 
thank God I had that through all the other stuff. And finally now, like the last few months, we're going back on site. So I'm really grateful. And it's amazing how much, I don't know how many new people we have in the audience tonight, but how much I learn from people who are new. Like they remind me of what it was like. You know, and if it wasn't for the people that are coming in fresh and hurting and struggling, and we can be in here for a while and hurting and struggling, as you've seen tonight, uh, but but that keep me in check about where I am with with my alcoholism and my disease of addiction. Uh, as I said, I um, did did uh, go back to school and got my bachelor's degree and thinking I'm never going to do this master's thing uh, just because I don't like school. It's like there's fear like around each corner because you got whatever length paper and you know all this stuff you got to be on the computer blackboard. I never got a computer till I was 40 because I went back to school but like we didn't even have a mouse when I learned how to type in, in high school and I didn't get over 17 words a minute so we have a long way to go. I'm still struggling with that. I've learned to use the appropriate fingers um, for the most part, but that's that's real growth for me, and I'm like, you're gonna have to finally figure this out if you're gonna like work and have to type. Um, anyhow, so uh, today I'm a um, clinical social worker and a licensed clinical addiction specialist, and um, it has allowed me to put my story, like, make a purpose of my story. And I can remember, like, between treatment two and three. You know, I was given so many opportunities, this family that was going to save me. I'd been waitressing at this country club where they were members of in the mountains for five years. And uh, just the nicest people. And they like, you're too good for this waitressing. Why don't you come down? We'll put you through school. They put me in a private college in Thomasville, Georgia, and put me on their, like, lake on their 200 acres in this little camp house, they called it. But it was a cool little cabin right on the pond. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm moving on. I got Dean Fliss going on, and then boom, she's gone for seven days. APV, where has Taylo gone? Uh, you know, I mean, and that was kind of like the cycle of my life. I was really good at building everything up and then tearing it all down, um, hurting the people that I loved that came to care about me. And uh, I have to say that was probably one of the most painful, painful parts of my addiction uh, was was hurting others, hurting my family. I didn't come to Southern Pines for about 10 years. I remember when I first moved back uh, 15 years ago, and yeah, 15 years ago, and somebody's like, Cameron has a sister. I don't, I don't think I've ever heard of you. I was like, I'm the best kept secret in the family. Uh, <laughs> you know, but like before I left, I was on the front of the pilot, like, and they got my name wrong. I'm named after my dad, and it said Mr. Taylor Compton arrested at Bostick's um, downtown. <laughs> anyway, so uh, no wonder they just like didn't want to claim, you know, on up to me because I'm different. Uh, anyway, so I do feel like a part of my family now, and I feel like a valued family member. Uh, I did, there came to a point, and I'm just going to spell this out because I wouldn't say it here anyways, but like the letter that, you know, like at the last treatment center they had me, and this was just about my relationship with myself. Like I, the other ones I had done a, relation, a letter to drugs, a letter to alcohol, whatever, and you know, I was already got all my anger out about them and how they had totally wrecked my life. And then this fourth one, we did those and there was like no emotion. They said, write a letter to yourself. And it started off with a four letter word that began with F. And then the second, second word was U. So I'm sure you can figure that out. Um, and then Taylor. So that was like the first line, boom. Um, that's when I thought, oh my God, like I hate myself. But it was eye opening about, I'm gonna have to forgive myself to get better. You know, and um, that's why I'm grateful for every experience. Everybody that tried to help me along the way, you know, there was a nice Christian family that took me in when I had a head-on collision in my car, like with $10,000 cash. Um, it wasn't my cash, but just the fact that I had cash, they were right on that at the sheriff's department. Um, anyways, and my family told me they couldn't, that I couldn't come home and they wouldn't take care of me. And I'm like in the hospital on day seven, uh, this nice Christian family came and said that, that I had gone to see the man once because I had a problem. And they, their family came and their 14 year old son gave up his bed for me, you know, and I couldn't walk for three months and they took care of me. Like I've had some amazing, wonderful things and people try to help me all along the way now. 
I'm really close with those people today, and I went to prison from their house because uh, that's just where the disease of addiction was taking me, you know. Um, but they loved me then, and they love me now. You know, I, I'm telling this part about loving a relationship with yourself because I think it's something we all struggle with coming into recovery. I know, I, and I can't say all y'all, but damn sure me. Oops, sorry, God. Um, I'm really working on the words. Uh, anyways. Um, yeah, because when I get really tired and emotional, sometimes I still struggle with the relationship with myself. And I have enough people that surround me, that love me, to keep me safe and calm. And then I got my yard, like I'm all about gardening. I didn't ride horses for three months. No wonder I was like about to have a mental breakdown. For, <laughs> just because horses are my thing, but they're one of the things I do for self-care. Um, you know, come to find out horses, like, can regulate your energy within a 30-foot radius. Who knew that? Like, they were lifesavers for me when I was a kid, but I didn't know, like, hey, there's more to this. Um, which it's been interesting more and more as I learn clinically, like, how things align for me. Um, anyhow, I might not make it the whole time. So I just want to say uh, that the women that I sponsor and my sponsors have really loved and supported me through the last three years. Uh, and I can't say thank you and how much that means to me. And they know they've done it because um, it hasn't been any secret about it. You know, like, I need you, like, you need me, I need you too. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and that's okay because they're, they're, they're women that I have relationships with, which women were not in my relationship standing, period. Uh, while I was out there, um, like they were drama, they were whatever, like I didn't want anything to do with them. I want to hang with the boys. And I started hanging with the boys when I was in high school. I had a little group. They like took me out on their dates. I was just one of the boys. Um, and I loved it. Uh, anyways, um, but I just got really a thing against women. And I love women today uh, as a result of my recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, like, there's a lot of things that I never thought would be happening and um, that are happening today and my life is a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. So um, I took a new job. Let's see, I finished up at First Health at the end of March. So April began this new job and thinking we'll have it together in a month to just start this kind of big deal thing. Um, and neither, none of us out of the three of us had ever done this particular <laughs> job venture before. Uh, and then like, but it, can, it, it got on, it, it's still going. Um, and I'm like, ah, uh, because I'm still learning uh, as the process goes and it's brought, I'm telling you what, prayer and meditation, I got it going on uh, because I really need it and I found out I can't survive without it. Uh, you know, same as I can't survive without meetings, I can't survive without recovery. Um, I can't survive without other people like you around because uh, when I get too much time around normal people, I might start thinking about like some self-reflection on me about how I'm different again and uh, being in here lets me know that I'm okay and I'm same as y'all. Oh, I got one more funny story. And I have told it before, so it'll be old news to some of y'all. But um, this is, again, near the, the end of my back-in-the-day stories. Actually, I was in recovery, so, um, you know, I guess I could tell a bit about that. Like, breaking all the rules early in recovery, like the don't get in a relationship with a guy. Y'all already know. I, I didn't tell you how many times I broke that rule, but it was like a regular basis. Because um, I was thinking, like, the right man's going to come along. It's going to be the picket fence. We might have a child. Like, never going to be a single mother. And then, like, at 35, I'm having a baby, and it's me. Uh, a lot of things. That's another thing I was never going to do, though, right? Uh, anyway, so, yeah, I, um, I think I had two months. No, I had three months. No, he, yeah, he had three months. I had two months. And, like, he's in the meeting, and I'm just thinking, I just got to have... Billy or relationship with Billy or whatever. He's so cute. He's so funny. He's got a great smile. What a wonderful accent. You know, and I'm not listening to things that people are telling me because I'm, I've learned not to listen and not to follow directions or suggestions. And, um, so I already knew better, but I'm used to breaking the rules and, um, neither of us had a car, but his mom, he was outside of town like 10 minutes. Well, I was outside of town like 12 minutes. He was outside of town like 10 minutes. So his mom could come my way and pick me up, you know, 
And uh, anyhow, I remember like three weeks into it, and I was having a moment of clarity, and I was like, what in the world am I doing in the relationship with this guy? Like, this is just, this isn't going to work. Uh, what was I thinking? And um, I, I was so afraid to tell my sponsor because she'd know that I was a loser and I broke the rules and everything, and um, I had to get on my knees before I had the courage to tell her. And she's like, Taylor, what were you thinking? And like, obviously I wasn't, or I was thinking about me. Um, but she said, like, I, I'm not so worried about you will, what will you will do, but I'm worried about what will happen to him. You know, and when I broke with, up with him, he did, he did relapse, and it took him a couple of years to come back. Now, I'm just not that important that I could cause somebody to relapse, and I'm not God. <coughs> but I wasn't helpful, I was harmful. You know, and I learned how my behavior can harm others. Uh, and he's been sober for a while now. I'm grateful for that. Uh, anyhow, um, so back in the, well, in the last five years when I really accepted the uh, addiction, uh, addict and alcoholic and I'm just going to live this life because there's no cure for me, I'm just broken. Um, you know, I got where I like to... Um, Pilfer was a word that we used, whatever. There were all these houses like out in the woods or just on the side of the road that nobody had been in for a while. They weren't locked. They may be locked, but the back door was open. There was a window. There was some way to get in. You know, I wanted to go see what I could have of theirs. Um, <laughs> yeah, I became a thief. Um, but anyways, so... <laughs> Sorry, that just brought a bunch of flashbacks of like the times that like the police are in the yard and we're trying to get out of the, the window on the other side of the house, like out in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. But the story was that I was in recovery two months and uh, I had put a sign up at the bottom of my driveway that's because I was kind of part-time sales and delivery um, type of thing. <laughs> And uh, I put a sign up at the bottom of my driveway when I got sober and really made a decision to do this right. No drugs or alcohol allowed on premises. Got it. And it's like on a piece of plywood about that big and up on a stick because I needed you to see that because you could, before you come top of my driveway because I might not have the power to say no. Um, but I had that sign and a couple of people that I used to pilfer with um, came up. They were a little Nissan truck. They're like, we're going, and you know, there was a whole story about justifying, rationalizing about why it was okay for us to go go in this house. So I go put on all my camouflage because I got camouflage clothes for pilfering, um, <laughs> and it's like nine o'clock at night, and maybe it was more like seven. I went too late, but it was dark, and it was in in the winter, and like there's four of us and a small Nissan cab truck, single cab truck, and I was like, I'll get in the back. And as I was getting ready to get in the back, it's the first time I would recognize, like, my gut yelling at me, and it's saying summer, 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 my daughter's name. But I'm used to shoving, shoving it down, shove it down, don't listen to it. And that's what the substances, alcohol and substances, allowed me to do is just shove it down so I didn't have to listen to it. So I didn't have any substances, but I was pretty good at shoving it anyways. And I got in the back of the truck, they covered me up with a blanket because it was cold, and I live 10 miles out of town, so it was just quiet and cold, and I'm laying down in the back of the truck for a while, and then we get to town, and like I could, you know, tell for the stoplights, and then what are stoplight, and then I hear someone talking to my friend Dave who's driving, and I'm thinking like, where are the stoplight, who's talking to him? And there was a little more conversation, and then we go a little bit further and we pull off, and then, like, I'm seeing all these blue lights, and I'm like, oh, shit, shoot. Sorry, God. Um, anyways, but all these blue lights start going around, and I'm just like, oh, my God. And, like, here I'm with these people who are known um, movers, sellers, shakers, distributors, and I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, anyways, but I'm so, I'm, like, laying down in the back seat, I mean, in the back of the truck, blank, covered up with a blanket, nobody knows, and I hear them talking, and them talking to, like, the, the DEA or whoever it was, um, and then the lady grabs my foot and says, there's a body in the back, <laughs> um, and I was like, it's Taylor, like, they all know who I am, um, <laughs> it's, it's Taylor, it's Taylor, and they had the dogs and, like, five, well, probably more like seven cars and people, and, like, my higher power was protecting me that night because no, those people, I didn't have anything on me and that wasn't part of my plan, but I was still doing the wrong behavior, <laughs> you know, and none of those people, we didn't have anything to get arrested for that night, and all I got to go home, and 
I told my, like, I know I was so afraid to tell my sponsor, uh, but I knew I had to tell her, and she's like, what are you, you know, what are you thinking? Um, and I saw that my higher power, like, saved me from myself that night, and I recognized that I had intuition, the um, God within me, inside of me, that could had a voice that I could listen to to know what was right and wrong. Um, and that I heard my daughter's name, and despite the fact that I shoved it down one more time, um, that I was, like, that was a big deal for me. Um, see, I think we actually made it. Um, and we ended on kind of a happy note. I didn't cry nearly as much as I thought I would. Um, anyhow, so, yeah, so the steps, I do want to talk about that. And um, I've done them twice. Uh, and I kind of like do them every time I'm leading somebody who's newer in the program through them because I do do my stuff with their stuff so they'll understand we got stuff. Um, anyways, but uh, totally had the powerlessness part, but I was amazed, and I'm still amazed um, when working with people every time uh, that you have a new step and you're going over and you're working, I'm just still amazed at how the big book like has it all written out and how clear it all is and how clear it identifies all this craziness that goes on with a group of people like us, certainly like me, and how I can unload it and get rid of it and clean it up and, and all of that. Uh, and the benefit of having a sponsor or two, in my case, uh, I've needed more this year and somehow that seemed to have worked with me to have more. Um, and I, I think I did apologize to the women that I sponsor because I've been like less available the last couple months and life has been so crazy. Uh, you know, and I did get to sit down with somebody this weekend and do the sixth and seventh step. We read the eighth and um, God, it's just so nice to be able to do that and be there for somebody. Uh, I do really care about people. I'm passionate about people. Uh, and, and my recovery has allowed me the grace to be able to, to be in the helping profession. Thank you.